You are listening to the Innovators Behind Disruption, a podcast series brought to you by Evolve ETFs. The world is evolving. Your investments should too. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the next episode of the Innovators Behind Disruption. My name is Raj Lala, CEO of Evolve. Also joined by a good friend of mine, Carol Piovasan. Carol, thanks for joining us. Thank you. So, Carol, maybe we could kick it off by uh, maybe giving everybody a bit of an introduction to yourself, uh, your background, and also what you're doing now as it relates to cybersecurity, privacy, AI, all of those things. Absolutely. Um, so thank you so much for having me here. Uh, I am a lawyer. I practice in the area of all aspects of data law and artificial intelligence. So what that means is I focus my practice on privacy law, uh, cyber readiness, incident response, uh, breach response, um, data governance, and then AI risk management. And really in that space, we're dealing with the sort of evolution of data law and data practices for companies in a really practical way. So we are helping companies get ready for their broader innovation agendas, but doing so in a compliant manner according to what I can only describe as ever evolving privacy law. Great. Um, hey, a quick question for you, and I don't know if this falls uh, right down your alley, but you might have a perspective on it. I was, I was reading a couple of days ago that the Biden administration in the U.S. may actually um, ban companies from paying ransom on uh, ransomware attacks. Uh, any thoughts on that? I mean, listen, there's a lot of work that's going into trying to better protect against ransomware attacks. And ransomware attacks are becoming ever more intrusive in the sense that, you know, it used to be the case that there would be a ransomware attack, you'd pay it, you'd get your belongings back and off they'd go, maybe hit you a little while later, but so far it would be okay. Now we're seeing a rise in the number of incidents of ransomware attacks where you ultimately pay the ransom to what we can only describe as a, you know, black market operation of hackers. Uh, God knows where in the world, although we have some ideas. And um, then you don't get your belongings back. So a ban on ransomware really increases the need for preparedness and for having a strong response plan in place and then doing your best to not sort of pay the hostage taker. Yeah, it kind of makes sense, right? I mean, because where, do, where does it stop then? Like Colonial right. just announced that they paid the ransom. Um, yeah. Their, on their attack, and if if this just sparks more cyber criminals, yeah. more organized attacks, all of a sudden we're, it's costing billions and billions of dollars uh, to companies. So when, at what point does the government need to come in and stop uh, the ability to pay the ransom, which hopefully will reduce the overall uh, cyber crime, but at the same time, you're I think you're spot on, which is potentially results in more spending on cybersecurity uh, for companies because they just want to make sure that they prevent it, right? Right. And the thing about spending on cybersecurity is we often think about that as only a technical spend, right? That you're spending on greater technical security safeguards. But actually what you find what we find when you analyze different breaches across the last you know 10 years, it's as much a technical defense as it is a governance defense. So what I mean by that, when you look at privacy laws across, around the world, you will see that you know, the, dominant, um, the dominant discussion is that for really strong safeguard mechanisms, you sort of need three. You need administrative safeguards, which are your policies and procedures, and I'm going to talk about that in one sec. So, but that's the first thing, you need administrative safeguards. You then need your technical safeguards, which is the firewalls, the encryption codes, all of that stuff. And then you need physical barriers, right? So do you have cameras in your office? Do you have locks on cabinets? That sort of thing. Um, increasingly, we find companies, so we found that a lot of companies have spent on the physical and technical safeguards, but have not spent enough on the governance safeguards, on the administrative safeguards. And so an incident happens, they have no policy in place as to what you should or shouldn't do, and they have no plan in place as to how to respond. 
So their response time is actually longer, which results in greater harm to the company because they're spending a lot more time with major business interruption and less time trying to shut it down, contain, and uh, you know, report on the breach where needed. So we are seeing this change in trend where spend is definitely increasing on the technical side, it's there on the physical security side, but now companies are starting to recognize the importance of those administrative safeguards so that they understand, they can first of all guide better behavior for their staff and they know how they're gonna respond if something happens. Hmm. I know that you're an expert on data privacy and you and I have had this conversation before uh, about data and I think I, I think I've asked you before but do you have any Google speakers or Alexa speakers at home so I I actually do I actually you do. do yeah are you one of those I people do. that I keeps them muted them. when you're not you, you mute them dude I have feeling so I have a feeling this is, this is the only way in my household. My husband keeps saying, like, I don't understand the big deal. I want them. They're convenient. And I walk around the house just muting them like I turn off. The <laughs> yeah. So um, talk, let's talk about data privacy, because I'm one of those people that doesn't seem to really care uh, so much about being tracked. And, 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 uh, and ha we have lots of speakers all over the house. In fact, I was saying to somebody the other day that I have 62 connected devices at home yeah. because like a lot of people, I was bored during the Christmas holidays and decided to do a walk around the house uh, to, to count them. So I've got a lot of data being transmitted uh, out there. And I know you're very focused on data privacy. So I've got I've, the first question that I guess I'll ask you is why do you think it's so important and what are the risks that we as individuals wear from a data privacy perspective? Yeah, so that sort of takes you right back to some of the fundamental questions of why does privacy even matter? Like, why do we care? Why does this matter? And I always start there because I go back when, too often when we're talking about privacy, we talk about compliance, which frankly, in all due respect to my own job is bo super boring, right? So nobody wants to talk about compliance. So go back to those first principles. Like, why do we care about privacy? Well, we care about privacy because that's a way to exert individuality and freedom. It means that we can be shielded from the eyes and judgment of others. And that right. means we can operate in a manner that is free to us, right? Increasingly, as you give up on elements of that privacy, you start to give up on elements of control over what people get to know about you. And in the real world, that happens through word of mouth. Um, but at a certain point, the broken telephone sort of dies down and off it goes and forever forgotten, except for in the minds of those four people who thought whatever they learned about you was hilarious. But in the digital world, that doesn't happen. You can't delete it. And in fact, you start to create an enormous repository on yourself. And when you combine that enormous repository on, uh, sorry, combine it with the use of technologies like AI that is sort of able to crunch all of that data and turn it into a really hyper accurate prediction about you, it starts to get scary. So mm -hmm. where privacy really took a turn was when we started to realize how much digital information we're handing over and how difficult it is to govern that information because it sort of exists across borders, it exists, it's very fluid, you can copy it, you can repeat it, it's very hard to delete. So that's why, privacy is so important and why I mute all my microphones because I don't need you know all of these different providers to necessarily hear everything that I say in my household what I do need is when I want my music played I can unmute it and just tell whichever provider it is what song list I want it to play while it's in the background so there's also, some kind of compromise there in today's world we all need more steps right so it forces you to walk across the room and press the uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, the, the and thankfully button. your Fitbit is tracking that and all that data <laughs> is going off somewhere yeah. yeah exactly instead of just walking to the fridge um, yeah. so stay let's stay on let's stay on data privacy for a moment because uh, you know I've been reading quite a bit about Google lately uh, in terms of their renewed focus around data privacy not tracking individuals it's potentially going to affect their advertising business um although it hasn't yet you have any observations on that so google's not alone apple has also come out with a very similar um uh, in fact they led with with that sort of 
greater disclosure on tracking and, and what you are as a company or are not allowed to do with tracking technologies. This, this, is, um, this is a trend that we are going to see continuing. It started with a lot more robust sort of law coming out of Europe in their general data protection regulation, GDPR, we've heard a lot about it. And under GDPR, there are really strong mechanisms around trying to reassert control for individuals over their own data, okay? And in one of those instances has been um, some really interesting case law around, I know those words are hard to put together, but really interesting case law around cookies and the sort of tracking of people across different websites as they navigate and what are you allowed to do and how much disclosure do you have to give. So we are seeing that it sort of started with the, um, well, it predates GDPR, but we've seen a lot more happening since GDPR, particularly with cookies, particularly with online tracking of individuals and a lot of concern around tracking with mobile devices. So do you really need, my kids download a 400 million games on my phone, I think every minute, because they keep popping up. Do you really need my location for Pokemon? Like not maybe for some of them, but not for all? No, so you should be giving me that disclosure and you shouldn't opt me into it. You should allow me to opt in to having that information disclosed. So that's where you see the law trying to wrestle back that control to individuals by forcing organizations who are collecting that information to be more upfront with their disclosure, but also not to rely on the opt-in, meaning mm -hmm. you're in the program unless you say you're not, but the rather they are required, or sorry, the opt-out, but rather they're required to opt-in. So your practice focuses in on data privacy, artificial intelligence, many of the areas that we talk about on our uh, podcast, um, for, for you, how has your practice changed like the last couple of years? Like what, is the, what, are, the, what are the types of things you're much more involved in today than you would have been uh, a couple of years ago? Yeah, so there are two particular areas that, were, that are really exploding for us right now. Um, the first has to do with data governance. So nobody really understands what that means, but essentially what you're talking about is working with an organization to understand what data assets they have, where they have particular risks or liabilities, and then what they can do to help de-risk some of those systems. So we do a lot of that, particularly in the healthcare space with public and private organizations. A lot of data governance work, because there's a lot of really sensitive data that's very valuable from a social benefit perspective, as well as a commercial perspective. The other area that is really my entry point into this entire world, but is now starting to explode, has to do with um, artificial intelligence and risk management around AI systems. So that in my world is really the use of the data for a particular purpose through, through um, a highly sophisticated system and what are the implications of that. And there are really interesting implications of AI systems at law, and I spent a lot of my time on that. So we've got a number of clients coming to us now saying, all right, help us with our algorithmic impact assessment, help us with our AI liability assessment. And because we have um, really strong expertise in AI, we understand how to make those connections at law as well. Um, take your lawyer hat off <laughs> for, for a moment, uh, because you're, 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 you're obviously, again, immersed into AI. What areas of AI do you find really interesting right now? And 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 address as well, yeah. you know, the, the 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 threat aspect of AI. Uh, meaning, you know, a lot of people are concerned that AI is going to replace jobs and uh, is going to result in a, a lot of job losses uh, out there in the market. So talk about both. Talk about what fascinates you and uh, and that threat. So what fascinates me really um, for right now is in the healthcare space. Uh, very topical, obviously, but there is so much happening in the use of artificial intelligence for triaging services, for diagnosing particular conditions, or for just helping to flag if somebody is at risk of something, right? So it could be at risk of a condition or at risk of deteriorating while in hospital and being a, a mechanism of second judgment that uh, clinicians can use. And it's really powerful. 
it's really powerful. So that's the one area of health. The second area that I'm extremely passionate about is moving into more personalized medicine. So not having treatment options that are sort of applicable to all and then you try it out and see what works on that particular individual, but really trying to narrow that focus to what would is most likely to work for the individual right from the get-go. And we're still a while away from there, but we're working really hard in Canada to get closer and closer to better personalized medicine. So those are the areas that I'm really excited about right now, among others. Um, and then we're seeing a lot in the world of sort of back-end AI, so things that are being used within organizations to just augment capabilities to make things more functional and efficient, and it's brilliant. Mm -hmm. So better calling centers, triaging calls, uh, better, you know, helping people understand how they speak. But we've got, I have this one great client that is better at, uh, sorry, that has developed an AI system that helps analyze your speech to determine how effective you are. I told them they should use it on me, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> They haven't, they haven't agreed yet. So uh, there are really amazing use cases that are coming out all the time. Very practical, very operational. The threats, uh, when things go wrong, if you don't, so when, what that means for something to go wrong is very broad in artificial intelligence. It is totally dependent on the use case. So what AI are you using for what purpose, right? In, and it's dependent on who's using it. Do you understand the vulnerabilities of your system? So can you properly interpret the output in a way that allows you to use it responsibly, okay? So again, in the healthcare sector, trying to sort of bridge the divide between technology and the practice of medicine is, it, you can see where there's great opportunity, but also great risk. And getting in there to help organizations do this better is really exciting for us. Um, the EU recently came out with draft, draft regulations on artificial intelligence. So for anyone who has some weekend reading or doesn't have weekend reading planned, I suggest that's something you pick up because you'll see that they do a good job of sort of triaging different risk categories and helping you, helping the reader to an extent understand what is prohibited, you can't do certain things, what is high risk and then what's minimal risk. Um. Pivot back to uh, to data privacy for a sec before we close off. Where are we in Canada as it relates to um, GDPR, for example, or an equivalent? And how far are we uh, from it? Um, so great question, because that is very fluid. Um, we have um, pri federal sector, federal private sector privacy law that is 20 plus years old. And the principles of that law align very nicely with GDPR, which is why Canada has always maintained its adequacy status with Europe, okay? Because our privacy law is generally aligned. But re rewind to November of 2020, um, when the Liberal government tabled a new bill that would substantially reform our federal private sector privacy law, um, and you'll see that it's taking us, that proposed bill is taking us much closer to the GDPR in certain ways, um, particularly when it comes to data mobility. So allowing people to get their data and move it around, deletion rights, and then certain aspects of automated decision making, as well as others. Okay, so there are a number of different areas. The issue there is it's still a bill, so it's not law yet. So for today at law, we still remain under the old regime, but all signs point to some form of reform, whether it's this particular bill or something else. All depends on what happens to the government. Got it. Uh, anybody wants to find you, where do they go? Very easy. I know, I know it's your house these days, but I mean in general, online. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's www.inq.law, easy as can be. Yeah, that's great. Listen, you've been a good friend of mine for the last few years. Great to see your practice flourishing. Obviously, it's in a really high demand area. So appreciate your time. Look forward to doing this again. My pleasure. Thanks so much. Thanks. You have been listening to the Innovators Behind Disruption, a podcast series brought to you by Evolve ETFs. Remain educated. Be informed. Sign up for our newsletter and learn more at EvolveETFs.com.